In the Buddhist time, there was a lot of talk about change. And uh, that's really what his first sermon was about. It's just another way of saying it. When he talked about uh, this thing of attachment and desire, and he illustrated uh, his idea of attachment and, and desire by talking about those things that he had seen, that he had seen illness, and he'd seen old age, and he'd seen death. And he said, these are the great sources of suffering in everyone's life, that they become ill. And he wasn't necessarily talking about they had a cold. Although some people are really unhappy when they have a cold because if they're high energy people, it slows them down and they can't get the things done they need to get done. So, but I always think that he was talking about more serious illnesses that really interrupt the life, uh, perhaps cause someone never to be able to do things they were able to do before. And of course, old age is the same way. Old age. Uh, causes us not to be able to do some of the things we could do before or not do them as well and eventually not do them as all at all because we lose the flexibility of our body and then of course death has a way of stopping all activity and so the buddha talked about these three things well this is change about 25 years ago i read an article it's one of those articles i never save anything I do and I don't. I say big stacks of stuff that once a year get thrown out. <laughs> but the stuff that I wished I'd saved, I never save. And this was a little magazine article talking about stress. This was back when people actually started to understand, for, and I don't know why they didn't know this, that stress was causing a lot of problems. Uh, <clears throat> we were making medical advances left and right. And uh, we were aware of the fact that, you know, heart conditions, we'd fixed a lot of things already by that time. You know, polio was a distant memory. Parents weren't afraid of letting their children go to the beach on hot summer days. When I was growing up, uh, there was a lot of concern about letting kids go to public places with lots of other people because they would get polio. But um, a lot of those things were gone. We weren't worried about them. And so we started zeroing in on other things. And heart disease was one of those things. Why people have heart attacks, why they have strokes. And interestingly enough, in our local newspaper, there was an article, and I heard it on the radio, talking about uh, broken hearts. I don't know if you saw that in the local newspaper. But it talked about broken hearts. And that um, people that had a broken heart exhibited a lot of the, the same characteristics as someone having a heart attack. But there were a lot of things that were different also. And doctors have done a study on this because they study everything. And they wanted the other doctors to know that if someone has a broken heart, and what they mean by that is it could be the old traditional thing of two lovers went separate ways or one lover lost another lover to a catastrophe or some great traumatic thing happened in someone's life and it hit them so hard that they exhibited these uh, the attributes of having a heart attack the heart didn't function very well but there were other characteristics which I'm not going to go into because I can't remember them anyway that if a doctor were to really look at what he was seeing he go well this doesn't completely look like a heart attack something's going on here well one of the things is that people with a broken heart can recover in a week or two, where people with a heart attack, it takes two or three or four or five or six months to recover from a real heart attack. Uh, and that's basically because there hasn't been damage done to the heart. There's been damage done to the human being in the sense that they're responding to some great stressful situation and the heart is kind of not doing its job. Um, Back about 25 years ago when I read this article, it was talking about stress and how it affected our life and how it affected us and, and our families and our health. And the thing that I caught on it, because at, at that time I was going through a lot of change myself, and it listed these various stressful situations. And if you've been around here very long, you've heard me use this as an, an intro to a talk before because I thought it was so very interesting. It talked about these very, very stressful situations for people. Divorce was one of them. And I think everybody 
would go, yeah, if, if you, you don't have to have had a divorce. All you have to do is be around people that are having a divorce or get really lucky like I did one time and spend almost a year with a friend who was going through a divorce and kind of holding his hand as he went through this really awful experience. Um, because I think happy divorces are pretty uncommon. They're only in movies. Yeah, you take the house and I'll take the dog. You take that car, I'll take this car. And let's do coffee next week. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Usually by the time, it's, it's a very, very, very unhappy situation. So divorce was right at the top of this list. And this list was not made up like this is more and this is less stress. It just showed these key areas. Um, getting married is right in there with the divorce. Getting married, an enormous amount of stress. I think some people are very lucky that they end up getting married, considering how much stress there is leading up to it. You know, <clears throat> And the better you want it to be, the more stress there is in there. The more perfect you want it to be, the more stress in there. Moving, just moving from one house to another, loaded with stress, and changing jobs, just packed with stress. And some people would say, well, one thing is really a lot worse than the other. Well, maybe it is, but it depends upon the person. <clears throat> some people can go into getting married and have very little stress. I mean, women accuse men of that all the time. Yeah. If you really cared for me, you would be as upset as I was and as strung out as I was. So I read this article about the time we were getting ready to move up here. And <clears throat> I thought, whoa, an illness. Illness causes a great deal of stress. Not just the fact that you're ill, but the way it changes your pattern of life. And so here we were, we were, we were getting ready to move and there's one stressful situation. And of course, there's going to be a job change, which is another stressful situation. And there might have been another one in there that I can't remember because I thought I totaled up three. And I thought if we survive this, we're doing really good. Because here were all these stressful things that we had to do. And it's all about change. And it's all about getting ready for change. And it's all about accepting the change. And Contrary to what a lot of people think, because they go, and parents will do this to children. Well, you chose to do that. That doesn't change the stress level because you chose to do something. It doesn't have anything to do with how much stress you experience. Um, it doesn't even have anything to do with how much stress you experience it if it's something you want. Okay, Kaya just got a job. Kaya's got to be going through some stress. May not feel bad to her, but it's still there. Because think of your first day on any job you ever had. <clears throat> you want to do good. Unless you've got serious psychological problems, you want to make a good impression. All the way across the board, you want to make a good impression with everyone. And you're very much attuned to that. That kind of sometimes can get in the way of doing a good job. You spend so much time trying to be good that you have a hard time being good. So <clears throat> this stress thing. Jackie has a running affair with a water god. You know, I made a mistake when she called me all excited about our, our website. And I said, well, at least you haven't had another water pipe break. That was, you know, put foot in mouth. She informs me, oh, yes, I have, and half the water to my house is turned off because another water pipe broke. And I'm trying to imagine, how can, somebody must be going out there with sledgehammers and breaking this stuff. How could water pipes continue to break like this? That's very stressful because that's a big interruption in your routine. This morning I thought about, because I, I always think of the person, the challenge, you know, um, because sometimes we tend to think of routines as being uh, very, very rhythmical, you know, kind of like Baroque music. 
there are these rhythmical repeating patterns. And so sometimes we'll look around and we'll say, well, <clears throat> that guy doesn't really have a routine. And I thought of myself when I was young, just out of the service. <clears throat> I got this really wonderful job for minimum wage, washing clothes in a commercial laundry, 14 hours a day. Boy, was that fun. What a, what a great career challenge. Um, the only reason that I even took this job and it didn't bother me that I was working six days a week, okay? The only reason I took this job is because I had just come back from a war and there was no set number of hours and you didn't get to say, well, it's my break time, okay? You just, you just went until you were done doing what you were doing and if you could grab a moment here or there, then you did it. And if there was a lull and you got to go someplace for relatively safe, you know, you might get a full night's sleep or something like that. So I walk into this job, which started like at 4 o'clock in the morning. It went to like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. It was, during, it was in November. So when did people send all their clothes to a cleaner and a laundry, you know, during the holiday seasons, right? And, um, and then I had one, one day. So I basically, all I did was work and go home and fall down, you know, make something to eat and fall down and sleep and go back to work and go home. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and then I had one night off where I went out and got plastered, okay? Hook up with a buddy, go to a bar, drink until I couldn't see straight, go home, fall down, sleep, very much like the other days, but I thought I was having a good time. And, and that's a lot like a serviceman's life, you know. That's very much like what you have in, in the military. I grew up in a Navy town where these guys would go out for a couple months on a, on a ship, and really all they had was work, and then they'd hit town. And nobody could understand why they immediately got drunk and then got in trouble. But that was their routine. And if you took their routine away from them, they'd be pretty unhappy. If you got into port and they said, by the way, guys, we've enlisted all of you in the local church choir, and while we're in port, that's what you'll be doing. No, I think you'd have an awful lot of people go A-W-O-L. So routines are a person's particular routine. And the more the routine is uh, ingrained, the longer people have these routines, the harder it is for them to be comfortable with the change. Um, I'm not very comfortable if I get up in the morning and I don't get a cup of coffee. Now, some people think that's because I'm a big grump in the morning, which I am. And some people think that's because I'm not a morning person, which I'm, I'm not a morning person. And some people think that's just because I spoil myself, which maybe I do. But the reality is my routine all of my adult life is to have a cup of coffee in the morning before I try to make any decisions about anything. And the silliest thing anybody can do is in the morning... The first hour I'm up is ask me a question. It just makes absolutely no sense. I don't understand why people talk to people in the morning. Okay, That's not what morning's for. Morning's for waking up. <laughs> right? And that cup of coffee, that little bit of extra jolt, that little bit of caffeine uh, is to help me wake up. And that's what the hot shower is for too, is to help me wake up. And that's my routine. And if you change my routine, you've got one unhappy person on your hands. Okay? And it, it may, you may feel it's really necessary to change this routine, but that isn't going to change the fact that I'm not very happy, and I might not be happy the whole rest of the day because you trampled on my parade. You messed with my routine. You didn't let me wake up before you wanted me to do something. And if you happen to be one of those... I think of them as a Freudian hysteric that wakes up in the morning with a smile on your face, you know, and you're awake, and you get up and you do things and you make decisions. I personally feel there is something seriously wrong with you. Yeah, it's genetic def defect going on there. And you're the same person at 8.30 at night, you're sleepy. And if somebody asks you to make a decision... You resent it, but it's just a difference. That's all it is. It's just how we're different. That's our routine. The routine may have really good reasons, 
maybe our biological little clock, you know, circadian clock and, and how, how we function and all of that. But it's still our routine. It's what we're used to. We look to be comfortable. And it's not selfish. It's a very reasonable thing. We look to be comfortable. And then we become uncomfortable. And we have problems. We get unhappy. We suffer discontent. And this is what the Buddha taught. Uh, I don't know whether the Buddha was a morning person or he was a night person or he was one of those oddities that was stuck in the middle. I had someone describing the other day. They started talking about, well, I'm not really a morning person. I went, oh, so you're a night person? Well, I'm not really a night person. And I never could figure out what they were because they didn't, as they were explaining this to me, I couldn't get the part where they woke up, you know, where they became alive. I couldn't figure out whether they were awake from the moment they got up till they went to sleep or they were asleep from the moment they got up and they went to sleep. But this change in routine, whatever it is, whether it's a broken water pipe or it's a house that burnt down or it's just simply a change at your job, maybe a change you asked for. You said to someone, let me do that. I can do that. Let me show you I can do that. And then you have to do it. And it's different from the daily routine that you've had and you become uncomfortable because we are creatures of habit. As the Buddha said, we are great bundles of habit, good and bad. And the practice is to go in and untangle that bundle and try to pull out the bad habits and not disturb the good habits too much. But at the same time, we're pulling out those bad habits to try to understand what our good habits are and to understand they are habits and to learn how to exhale and to relax a little bit and to not get upset when even our good habits, the good things we do, get interrupted. Because life is one interruption after the other. And you cannot escape it, no matter what you do. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It might have something to do with how bad you are. I don't know. I believe very much in the law of, law of karma. But you can be as good as you possibly can be, and a water pipe will break. And in Buddhism, we have this great excuse for that. We just say, well, that's karma from a previous life. Because obviously, obviously, Jackie hasn't done anything in this life that she should be punished for. But she was a little snot in her last life. And so it's all coming to roost in this life. But these things are going to happen. No matter what you do, they're going to happen. It's called living. And you've got a choice. You've got a choice between living and you've got a choice between hiding. And the hiding choice isn't a very good one. You can turn that into a routine that's comfortable. And if you hide effectively enough, you can get so comfortable with it you think you've got something going on. I like to tell people they act like they were raised in a closet. Because a closet is a very, except for people like me, that's a little bit claustrophobic. Everybody else, it's a pretty good place. <laughs> you know, because it's constant. It's always dark. You can reach out in all directions and feel all the walls. You might have to jump to feel the ceiling. Everything's known. No surprises. It might be a little boring, but it certainly is comfortable. Even boredom can be comfortable. Listen to people complain about it. Everybody knows at least one person that thinks their life is boring and there's no challenge in it. And so they share this with you, don't they? You get to listen to how boring their life is and how there's no challenge in it. Over and over and over again. But you step out of the closet and you walk into life in life, you don't know how anybody gets bored. Because if you're outside the closet, if you're fully engaged in life, if nothing else, you've got to deal with this change. You've got to deal with the stuff that you can't control. That's another thing the Buddha talked about, was trying to control things. It goes right with change. I want to stop this change. You can't do it. 
it won't happen. You can't control yourself. You can't control anything else. So you have to accept change. It's constant. Whether it's the fact that you get ill, whether it's the fact you get up in the morning and you're, you, you can barely move because your body is not working with you, whether it's the fact that you don't like what you see when you look in a mirror. I'm always pleasantly surprised myself because I do not have too spectacular an image of myself in the mirror. So when I actually look in it, I do that once a day. Normally, while I shave, and usually I'm not paying attention to what I look like. What I'm doing is paying attention to not trying to cut my nose off. I was given a new kind of razor that I have decided never to use again after three times of cutting my nose. One of these things with multiple blades that flexes and goes all over the place, and I have discovered my shaving pattern does not work with this because I keep cutting myself right there as I go. So <clears throat> my brand new razors were thrown out, and I went back to my little Bix because I don't try to cut my nose off. But there is this moment when I wash my face after shaving and I actually see myself. Always a surprise. Not always pleasant, but always a surprise. And I'm still there. And of course, that's an important moment because that's a moment when you could go, what happened? I know exactly what happened. 59 years happened. Almost 60 happened. And I look and I think, don't look a day over 58 looking pretty good. Smile at myself. That's what I used to do in the army when they made me get up at five o'clock in the morning and there was no coffee. You had to wait for the coffee. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I would go down and shave and wash my face and look at myself and say hi and smile. Made myself do it. Made the day a lot better. I started a routine. Later on, people thought I was crazy, of course, which is probably true eccentric at least. But you're always going to run into this change. It's always going to happen. You're going to buy a brand new set of tires like I did one time, take off from Long Beach to come up to the high desert for a retreat on the weekend, drive over the biggest nail I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> and destroy a brand new tire. In January, in the Cajon Pass, changing a flat tire and just had new tires put on the car. And here's this sp like railroad spike sticking out of this brand new tire. You can't control it. All you can do is exhale and relax, just like we do in meditation, and just move on.